say some things about uh, the homily on anger and on being attentive to yourself before we get into um, on social justice. We talked a little bit about uh, the homily against anger yesterday about you know how you can throw fire on an argument by by adding to the argument <clears throat> and um, on page 86 towards the bottom he's still talking about uh, anger in he says, you know, suppose somebody says something negative about you. Suppose he calls you a poor laborer. Which what he means by that is a bad worker. If he speaks truly, admit the truth. But if he lies, what are his words to you? That is, what damage has he done? Neither be filled with conceit about praise. That is... Don't believe what others say about you, even when it's positive. Okay? Um, don't be filled with conceit about praise that goes beyond the truth, nor be aggravated over insults that do not apply. Notice how he's saying, don't take either of them. Because if, if you take praise that is given to you, and you believe it, what happens? As he said, you become conceited. Okay. Similarly, if you take censure that's given to you and you believe it, what do you do? You believe worse about yourself than is than is true than what's in reality. Okay. And then he goes on and he starts to talk about you know poor. If you know because he said if you're a poor laborer, why does being called poor bother you? He says it's not shameful to be poor, and this, he's really going to hit this idea in our social justice. But it is shameful not to bear the poverty nobly. That is not to bear it well. <coughs> because again, poverty and poorness isn't only monetary. You can be poor in spirit. You can be poor in talents. One person can sing, another person can't carry a note. You can be poor in abilities that others have, etc. Okay? And so when he says, you know, it is shameful not to bear that poverty nobly, what he means is it's shameful not to accept your limitations nobly. To wish that things were otherwise would be ignoble. It would be an unnoble thing, okay? Um... And then he goes on and says, you know, what if somebody hits you? Well, so is Christ. What if somebody spits in your face? So is Christ. And what did he do? He didn't call down 12 legions of angels. He didn't jump off the cross. He didn't make the person, you know, vaporize or disappear or something. He took it. Were you falsely accused? So was, I love this passage, so was the judge. You know, the judge is the one who judges. Who The judge was accused. Did they tear off your garment? They did him too. In other words, what he is suggesting without coming out obviously in saying it, is what did Christ say to his disciples before he left? I was persecuted. You will be persecuted. Don't expect anything less. Okay? So... If you are persecuted, if you are troubled, if you are beaten, if you are spat upon, if you are robbed, if you are all these kinds of things, why would you expect anything different? I mean, that's really the point St. Basil is getting across here. If you're going to call yourself Christian, okay, then this is what you must expect. Right? So, let these enter your mind, he says, and hold back the flames. The flames of what? Anger. If you are cognizant of these realities, he says, there will be no cause to get upset. There will be no reason to get full of anger. All right? 
I'm going to skip a whole, in fact, I'm going to skip the rest of it. Um, I mean, there's other stuff we could talk about, but we need to move on. Look at the homily on the words, be attentive to yourself. Okay? As one of the reasons that made me decide I wanted to say a couple things about this. A um, family member posted on something on Facebook the other day, a quote of Lewis's. Well, it's attributed to Lewis, and it is from Lewis. It's, I think it's slightly worded differently. The quote is, you are not a body. You are a soul. You have a body. Okay? The whole point of being attentive to yourself that's, that's being talked about here is to not focus on the material self. It's to focus on the soul. So, for example, he says in section 3 on page 96, Be attentive then to yourself, that is, neither to what is yours, possessions, you know, stacks and racks and bookcases of books and such, um, nor to what is around you, but only to yourself. Be attentive to what is yours. Now, you know, we're going to see some of the homilies that he talks about in social justice. You know, to the rich man, to, to the guy who's playing on building more barns. Those are the things he has. Those are the things around him. What is the rich man and the guy building the barns not thinking about? Himself. All right? So, he says in the middle of that paragraph, Actually, it's about a third of the way down. Do not be attentive to the flesh, nor pursue its good in every manner, health and beauty and enjoyment of pleasures and long life, nor admire wealth and reputation and power. Well, why not? He says, you know, those things can be of service to you in this temporary life, but none of them is lasting. That is, even though the body is good, going back to Genesis, all right, even though the body is good, the body is not permanent. The soul is permanent. The soul is immortal. The body will die and rot away. Yes, according to Christian doctrine, the body will be resurrected. But that resurrected body will not be this same flesh and blood body. It will be a spiritual body. Yes, it will be a body that can't eat fish if it wants to like Christ's was, you know, on the Sea of Galilee. So he says, no, here's what I mean. Be attentive to yourself, that is, to your soul. Adorn it. Take care of it. That is, don't worry about adorning your physical body. Adorn your soul. Take care of it. So that all the filth befalling it from wickedness may be removed through attention. Just as you remove filth on the body through attention. Why do you do that? You clean it. So how do you clean the soul? You take a soul shower. Well, how do you do that? Be perfect in heaven. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, how do you be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect? Those who love me, love him who sent me, and they will do the works of him who sent me. Well, what is the works of him who sent me? Love one another. Okay? So, all the shame due to evil may be cleansed away, but adorn and brighten it with all the beauty that comes from virtue. All the beauty that comes from virtue. Notice, behaving virtuously, acting virtuously, according to St. Basil, does what? It puts on clothes. It clothes the soul. Robes of glory is the terminology that St. Ephraim and St. Andrew of Crete, the poet I mentioned the other day, would refer to. So, how do you be attentive to yourself? You examine what sort of being you are. You know your nature. That is, you know that your body is mortal and that your souls are mortal. And that our life is therefore kind of twofold. As Lewis, I, I said the other day, talks about, you know, in Screwtape, we're amphibians. We're both here and there. 
as it were. So, one kind is proper to the flesh, something else is proper to the soul. So, be attentive to yourself, neither remaining in mortal things as if they were eternal. That is, recognizing that no matter how much exercise you do, how many supplements you take, how much health food you eat, guess what? You're going to die. Okay? You're going to die. I mean, scientists are now talking about they think they may have found, you know, something that will enable people to live to 150. Big flipping deal. 150 is not really any different than 50. It's just 100 more years. It still means you're going to die. Whether it's 150, 250, 350, or you're Methuselah and you're 969. You don't reach 970. You don't reach eternity in that sense. So, nor despising eternal things as if they were passing. All right? So, look down on the flesh, for it is passing away. And I think what he means there is not necessarily, it's probably interpreted this way some, but I don't think it necessarily means this, to despise the flesh. I don't think he means that. I think what he means is, look at it realistically. Realize that as you go through life, as you go from one decade to another decade, you're going to reach a point at which you can't do things that you could do previously. And the older and older you get, the less and less you can do. But, while you realize the flesh is weak, the body is passing away, take care of the soul, because it goes on. For it is something immortal. Understand yourself with all exactness that you may know what gift to apportion to each. That is, what gift to apportion to the body, what gift to apportion to the soul. He's not saying totally deny your physical needs, because that's suicide. And it's all, it is also vanity. Okay? So, for the flesh, nourishment and coverings. The body does need to eat. The body does need coverings. Or you'll catch sick and die. The soul also needs nourishment and coverings. What are they? Doctrines of piety. Education in, notice this, courtesy. Courtesy. Good manners. Good behavior. Training in virtue. Well, what are some of the virtues? Honesty, loyalty, loyalty, truth, justice, fairness. I mean, you could go through a whole big long list. Fidelity or faithfulness, you know, friendship, right? Correction of passions. Correction, bringing them back. What does that word literally mean? Co-rightness. Making the passions which tend to lean. Correctness. This part <coughs> is from com, which means with. This, the rec, is what means upright, straight. You could say orderly, bringing the passions back in order. In other words, love is a good thing. Hatred can be a good thing, properly directed. Anger is a good thing, properly directed. But anger misdirected or anger lacking direction okay, is obviously a bad thing, as with love, as with every other passion. So... Don't fatten the body excessively. Notice, fatten the body, but not excessively. Okay? And then he goes on and says, okay, so now what do you do with the soul? Likewise, also the word in the next paragraph. 
Uh, section four, about four lines down. I sure hope none of you guys get this crud I have because whatever it is, it's just coming back and, man, it's horrible. Uh, likewise, also the word, a physician for our souls. Okay, the word, he's talking about Christ, obviously. Thoroughly cures the soul afflicted by sin through this small aid. Be attentive. He's also talking about the word, the word of God, the case, scriptures. Be attentive then to yourself. Notice he uses the same phrase over and over. That you may also receive the aid of healing proportionate to your offense. That is, you've done something wrong, so you need healing to fix whatever is wrong. But you don't heal, you know, a splinter in your finger by cutting off your arm at the elbow. That would not be proportionate, okay? Similarly, if your hand has gained green all throughout it, you don't take two aspirin and call me in the morning. That would not be very proportionate. So, if the sin is great and severe, you need many confessions. Okay, now keep in mind he's talking about, he's talking as a priest, okay? He's talking to a congregation, a parish, reminding them, for soul work, for, for ills of the soul, it is necessary to confess one's sins. You might need what if the sin is great? Many confessions. That is, it might take a, a lot of digging by the surgeon to get the splinters out. What else? Bitter tears. Why? Have you ever tried to dig a deep splinter out of yourself? Tears are involved. It's painful. Similarly, confessing great sins. None of us like to admit when we were wrong, all right? Earnestness and vigils. He's talking about prayer there. Continual fasting. Why continual fasting? To train the body, to teach the body. It's not what's ultimately important. But if the transgression is light, let the repentance be equal to it. It might be something simple. It might simple, simply be... An act of restitution. You've taken something from somebody, give it back, and maybe give them more. All right? So, for each of us who are disciples of the word, he says, excuse me, for each of us who are disciples of the word is a servant in one particular activity appointed to us among those in accord with the gospel. What? What's he mean? Well, what does St. Paul say? Not all are apostles. Not all are preachers. Not all are evangelists. Not all are prophets. Christ gave some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be preachers, some to be teachers, some to be ministers of the word, some to be deacons, some to be servants of the table. Okay? No. So what did he do? In the great house of the church, there are not only vessels of every kind, gold, silver, wood, and earthenware, if you're anything like me, you want to be one of the gold ones. You don't want to be a piece of earthenware. What's earthenware? A mud pot. It's pottery. Okay? We'd like to, you know, be nice, shiny, valuable gold. But there are also, he says, skills of all kinds. Now, if you're anything like me, that's, that's a hard part to listen to. Because I want to, you know, if I'm at church, I want to be doing something that somebody else is doing usually, not what I'm doing. It's the whole adage of the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. All right? No, he says why? Because the house of God is the church of the living. And therefore, what does it have? Hunters, travelers, architects, builders, farmers, shepherds, athletes, soldiers, teachers, Lawyers, legislators, presidents, okay? What does he mean? Each one of them has a role. Why? Because the church is the body of Christ. And what does everybody have? I mean, just hold up your hands. It's got hands, it's got legs, it's got head, it's got a chest, it's got a torso, and there aren't more than two ears, so somebody's an ear, somebody else is an ear, somebody is a cuticle on the little finger, and somebody is a nose, and somebody's a brain, you know. 
doesn't mean one role is more important than another. They're all necessary in order for the body to be what? Complete. It's interesting that, that soldiers is actually included just on that list because there's you know there's some people who characterize some you know the general tenor of the early church as, you know, being against any being involved in any sort of warfare. Oh, yeah, which would that characterization would be entirely wrong. Many of the early saints of the church were guys who were Roman soldiers. I mean, Roman soldiers who were good soldiers for Rome, who did what the emperor wanted, etc. The reason they became saints was because usually the emperor then would decide to go to a persecution of Christians, and those soldiers would draw the line there. They'd say, sorry, can't, because I am one, you know, at which point they would be murdered. Right, uh, but yeah, there's Theodore the general, Theodore the soldier are two major ones that are. Um, Saint George was a sol the real Saint George was a soldier, not the fictional one, you know, with the dragon and everything. Uh, I mean, just a bunch of them. The fictional one is so much more fun. Yeah, he's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, turn to page one hundred and one for a moment, and I think this is. About the last I want to say about this. He's saying, um, okay, actually, page 100, look at that, beginning of that second paragraph, be attentive to yourself, again. Now, he means a couple of things here. Um, and I, I don't mean just in this one passage, I mean by that phrase. Look to yourself, but what's he also saying? Don't worry about what other people are doing. Don't worry what their soul is like. God will determine what their soul is like. Okay? The word is for you when you are brilliantly successful and all of your life is flowing like a stream. That is, everything's just running smoother than silk for you. Be attentive to yourself. Why? What sometimes happen, happens when everything just seems to be going wonderfully for you. What can happen to someone when that's happening? <coughs> happens, it happens in the epic poem Beowulf. Hrothgar delivers a homily to Beowulf. And it's what scholars usually call this thing, a homily. Where Hrothgar tells Beowulf after Beowulf kills Grendel and Grendel's mother, he says, you know, there once was a man who rose to power. Everything went well for him. Had all the power he could want. Had all the money he could want. You know, da, 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 da. And he got to the point where he forgot about God. Why? Because he thought everything that he had, he earned it on his own. And what happened? As soon as that happens, trial comes. And he loses everything. And what Rothgar comes on, goes on to eventually say is, uh, I was talking about me there, Beowulf. <laughs> Don't give in to pride. All right? That's what he's going to get at here. It is useful, that is, being attentive to yourself, is useful in protecting you as a kind of good advisor, bringing a reminder of things human. Well, what does that mean, a reminder of things human? Well, how about this? Nothing ever lasts. The good times don't keep on rolling. For anybody. Okay? Now, go on to the next section. He says, okay, now imagine for a moment, you're not wealthy. You don't have everything going for you, but you're born low and obscure. That is, you're a nobody. Nobody knows about you. You're a poor person, born of the poor, without home or country. You are sick. You're in need every day. You tremble at those in power, and you cower because of your lowly life. In other words, we would say in modern parlance, you're a loser. You just have nothing. Okay? Don't despair, he says. Don't despair. Don't be enviable of others. Why? 
Well, here's a good reason. You're a human being. You're the only one of the animals formed by God. In other words, that loser, so to speak, he is saying, is of infinite worth and value. He's worth more than all the animals put together. Why? Made by God. Period. Okay? He says, because you have come into being according to the image of the Creator, you can ascend quickly toward equality of honor with the angels. How? Through good conduct. Notice, not through wealth, not through reputation, not through earning earthly glory through good conduct. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you can't also have good conduct. This is going to be, you know, one of the messages um, my students are going to, in another class, you're going to find out on Tuesday in The Wife of Bath's Tale in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Because the, what The Wife of Bath, her tale is getting at is nobility of character has nothing to do with how one is born. It has nothing to do with where one is born. Nobility of character has everything to do with how one behaves with those that are around one. Okay? That's what he's talking about in terms of conduct. Okay? You've been given an intellectual soul through which you comprehend God. You perceive by, perceive by thought the nature of beings. You pluck the sweetest fruit of wisdom. It says all the animals, all this... These are all subject to you. Remember? Rule the earth. All right? So, why are you downcast? Because your horse doesn't have a silver bridle. Or, let's update that. Why are you downcast? Talking to myself here. Could you drive a... How old is that car? 17-year-old <laughs> car. Why are you downcast? Because you don't wear X, Y, or Z clothes. Why are you downcast? Because you don't have X, Y, or Z phone or watch or whatever, right? He says, you have the sun carrying its torch for you in a swift race through the whole day. Notice what he says. The sun is working for you. It's not working for itself. It doesn't exist on its own. All of this, he says, is for you. It's not for the animals. Right? It's for humanity. So, if you are attentive to yourself, section 7, you will discover these things about yourself and more. You will enjoy the things present, and you won't be downcast about what you lack. In other words, you will be, as St. Paul says to be, content in all things. If if you are attentive to yourself. That is, if you think about your soul, what your needs are, and such. Okay? Um, let's stop there on that book. Sorry, I didn't mean to say, let's check out. <clears throat> Turn to On Social Justice. Um, I don't want to talk a lot about the introduction simply because I read it too quickly and haven't marked it up at all. Mention something. Um, about what he talks about on what the editor talks about. <clears throat> On page 27, and then we'll talk about this as, as we see it in some of the homilies. <coughs> it's the, the distributive mandate. Okay? Your editor writes on page 27, The corollary to Basil's teaching with regard to the ethic of sustainability is what might be called the distributive mandate. The content of the distributive mandate is that whatever one has that is extra or over and above one's actual needs should be given to those who have less. Well, 
What does Christ say? If someone comes to you, you have two cloaks, give them one. Why? Because you don't need to. You can't wear two of them. Well, you can, but it's very <clears throat> uncomfortable. Okay? So what's he talking about? Basil describes this pro and I don't know Greek. Basil describes this process with a beautiful Greek word, which is Greek to me, which literally means to restore the balance. All right? To reestablish equilibrium. Because how would there not be equilibrium? Well, if you have one person over here <coughs> who has two of something, and you have one person over here who has nothing, that's a lack of balance. So you put that over there, and now they're in balance. Nature is in accord, in other words, as a result of that. All right? So, the distributive mandate is essentially a responsibility to observe the commandment of love by sharing with others. Well, what's the commandment of love? Love one another. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what it means. Okay? So, quotes the passage from Basil about the bread you're holding back for the hungry. There's another uh, a similar statement was made by the Russian philosopher Nicholas Berdyaev back in the early part of the 20th century. And he said, bread for myself, how did he put this? Bread for myself is a material thing. Bread for my neighbor is a spiritual thing. He doesn't mean that my neighbor might need bread. It's a spiritual issue for the neighbor. It's a spiritual issue for me. If my neighbor lacks bread and I have it and I don't share it. Okay? It's a material issue for me because it's just there. Exactly. Okay? So, take those ideas... And go to the first um, homily, <coughs> excuse me, to the rich. And it's a homily on this passage of the book of Matthew. Someone came to Jesus and said, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Okay. This, by the way, I think is... <coughs> Um, if there is one. I think it's the text behind, or it's the text that is the basis for Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. Because of how the, the individual comes and talks to Christ. Okay, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, well, which ones? <laughs> Notice, well, which commandments? It's like a student coming up and saying, you know, of everything we've talked about, what do I need to know for the exam? Okay. Jesus said, well, these. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I've done all these. Okay. Jesus said, huh. Oh. <clears throat> So you want to be perfect then, okay. Go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And the young man goes away grieving. Why? Because he's loaded. <laughs> he has many possessions. Notice, we've spoken previously about this young man. It's Basil saying, you guys know what I'm going to say. You've heard this homily before, or something similar to it, all right? But I want to skip um, <clears throat> quite a bit and go to page 43. Okay? Because he talks about the motives of the young man and all this kind of stuff. Um, top of 43, about a third of the way down, in that paragraph that begins, it is thus evident. He asks, after a question, care for the needy requires the expenditure of wealth. In other words, you can't care for the needy simply by saying, oh God, remember the needy and send them, you know, plenty of food or send them clothing. Does, you know, is there a tractor beam or whatever from heaven with clothing to the needy? No, it involves people. 
When all share alike, dispersing their possessions among themselves, they each receive a small portion for their individual needs. Thus, those who love their neighbor as themselves ow, possess nothing more than their neighbor. Yet surely you seem to have great possessions. Okay? Those who love their neighbor as themselves possess nothing more than their neighbor. Why? Well, if you love yourself and you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, then your neighbor should be loved in such quantity that your neighbor has what you have. Okay? Just really, you know, let that sit and, and percolate for a while. Because what's he saying? There would be no inequality if people really lived this way. And he does go on to talk about the early church, how they, in not this homily, in another one, how they did what? They had everything in common. Okay? So, go on to the next paragraph. If you truly loved your neighbor, it would have occurred to you long ago to divest yourself of this wealth, to have shared what you have. Had you clothed the naked, skipping a couple lines, had you given your bread to the hungry, had your door been open to every stranger, had you been a parent to the orphan, had you made the suffering of every helpless person your own. Notice, what do people do for their own suffering? They attempt to alleviate it. So, if you had made the suffering of somebody else your own suffering, if you had done what Christ said, borne the other's burdens, what money would you have left? <laughs> the loss of which to grieve. Okay. We're not necessarily talking about to the rich man, to the Bill Gateses of the world. The rich man is the person who has more than somebody else. So, I'm a very rich person. I have a lot more than a lot of people. Okay, you are all probably very rich in one sense or another because you undoubtedly have more than some other people. It might not be your physical neighbor. It might be somebody else across town, somebody in another city, somebody in another country, etc. So, if you had decided long ago to give to those in need, how would it be unbearable now to distribute whatever was left? That is... <clears throat> If you had thought long ago about it, you wouldn't be worried now about giving away what you have. Okay? And he gives us examples. People don't, you know, hesitate to give away at festival time. I mean, look at, go to New Orleans and Mardi Gras. People are throwing stuff off balconies. Yeah, some of it's just cheap little baubles, but not all of it. I mean, they're throwing things out, not junk. Okay? Why? Because it's all part of the party atmosphere. But two days after Mardi Gras? Nope. You know, they're back up behind their locked doors, shotgun at the ready. So, section two. And I, I love how he puts this. What is the use of wealth? What does he mean by use? <clears throat> Robert? How can something help you twice or needlessly? It, how, how are you using it? Exactly. How are you using it? Yeah, two pairs of shoes. What do you know with two pairs of shoes? Okay. What is its purpose? And, and again, I'm going to use another Beowulf reference. You see the exact same question come up in Beowulf. The question comes up, it, what is the purpose of gold? What is the purpose of wealth? And within the context of Anglo-Saxon or Germanic society, the purpose of wealth and gold is to be distributed. It's to be given away. The good king is the one who gives away wealth. The bad king is the one who hoards it. And we see that because you have a, a force of nature that is an implacable hoarder. Dragons. Dragons hoard wealth. They don't do anything with it. They sleep on it. Talk about your bank account. That's all it is. It's never used for any good. And so we, we get this one passage in Beowulf where this guy buries all this treasure. 
And he says, hold now earth as useless now as it ever was before. Why? Because the wealth that he's putting back into the ground hadn't been distributed. Hadn't been shared out. Hadn't been used for the benefit of the people. Right? That's what he's talking about here. You want to wrap yourself in fine apparel? Fine. Surely two lengths of cloth are sufficient for a coat. In other words, you don't need more. You want to spend your wealth on food? Okay. Loaf of bread's enough to fill your stomach. You don't need a great big walk-in pantry. I mean, we could really step on a lot of toes in, in going through this homily. When wealth is scattered, next paragraph, when wealth is scattered in the manner which our Lord directed, he says it does what? It naturally returns. But when it's gathered, it naturally disperses. That is, the more you try to hold on to it, the more it slips through your grasp. The more you give it away, the more you get in return. If you try to keep it, you will not have it. And if you scatter it, you will not lose it. All right? And so he quotes Psalm 112. They have distributed freely. They've given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. This is not a... a um, oh, what's the phrase I want? This is not a, a gospel of, you know, Give it, a, give it all away so that God will give you necessarily even more. This is a give it all away so that you what? You earn up treasure in heaven. Not necessarily more material earthly wealth. All right? Okay, let's skip a bunch unless you have comments or questions. Well, I, I don't know how, how often we're going to come back to this same point. I assume a lot because it's very competitive. But um, I, I, we were talking outside about how, you know, the, uh, like, he makes reference to Job later on. Sure. And, you know, of course, Job was very wealthy in Job. Um, and, and... Both at the beginning and the end. Right, at the beginning and the end. And there's not, if you went back and you read Job, and of course, I haven't in a while, but, like, I don't remember any real um, significant emphasis put on how Job used his wealth um, in terms of, you know, he didn't he or there, I, I guess he could have, but it didn't. It didn't. There wasn't a suggestion that he just went around distributing it, you know, like because he, you know, it, it says that he he had this many oxen, and this right, many, you right, know. Um, and so and and so it, and, and and we can't settle upon the simple idea that Basil just had read Job because obviously he has, right, um, you know. Uh, so my question is like, because as reading through this, he never seems to address that, like he. He talk he talks about the rich young ruler in um, in Matthew in, in Matthew, but he doesn't <coughs> talk about and he doesn't talk about how wealth is you know viewed in the Old Testament saints you know that's true and that's because the accounts that we you know for example some of the accounts that you have in the Old Testament like with the passage of Job the book of Job does doesn't say anything right. about Job's giving away of wealth you know. Similarly, um, the story of, make sure I don't mess it up here, Jacob. Okay, you know, Jacob goes to work for Laban to marry his daughter, uh, Rachel first, no, Leah first, and then Rachel, but he gets him switched. Um, Rachel first gets him switched. He ends up with Leah first, and he works seven more years for Rachel. Well, what happens? God blesses Jacob tremendously. So Jacob gets you know, what we would call filthy rich. I mean, thousands upon thousands of head of cattle and sheep and all this kind of stuff, and children galore, and I you know four is enough. <laughs> uh, but we, we don't hear about Jacob going out and, and spreading forth the wealth. Somebody Why? with Abraham. Yeah, well, because those, those stories aren't emphasizing that aspect. Those stories are emphasizing other truths. The truth he's trying to emphasize is partly dependent upon the situation. Okay, and I, I don't, I haven't said this. You know, um, 
Basil, you know, was bishop, archbishop of Caesarea and such. Um, he was pretty fearless. When the emperor came and raised taxes to such an extent that he essentially demanded everything that people had, all their wealth, Basil went to the emperor and said, you must stop. I mean, little old frail, frail kind of priest challenging, you know, the leader of the known world. And um, the emperor didn't really care for being challenged like this, but he eventually did give in. That is, Basil did convince him that he saw the wrong. And the church has this tradition that what Basil did was the, that he got the emperor to give back from this, this one area, okay, all the material that he had collected, all the wealth, gems, gold, silver, etc. And Basil didn't know how to redistribute it. He didn't know what belonged to people, okay? And so a miracle occurred. What he did was he builds, bakes this huge loaf of bread, essentially, and he puts all the, all the stuff in it, all the gold, all the silver, all the gems, etc., from like this town, okay? So, I mean, we're not talking about stuff for 100,000 people. We're talking about, you know, belongings maybe for, I don't know, 50 people or 100 people, something like that. And he bakes this big loaf of bread, and he serves it to the town, and he cuts it. Number of slices for the number of people there are. And each person takes a slice, and the slice has exactly what was taken from them. Okay? So the point of the story is not, oh, Basil's so great, you know, he does this miracle and everything. But the point is, he gets the emperor to see the error of his ways, and the material gets returned to the people. Okay? Why? They're poor. The, the emperor's already the emperor, <laughs> you know? In Byzantium, he's got oodles and oodles and oodles of wealth and such. Okay. I guess by this time he's already more rich than the Roman emperor. Like yeah, that after, I don't know. After Constantine, well, again, I'm I'm recalling my world history class from a couple of semesters ago, and that you know after Constantine sort of made. Um, what, Constantinople, once Constantinople became New Rome, the thing was is that Constantinople had always been the place that produced all the wealth, and it all got sent to Rome. But then, when because Rome was capital, and so you know, when Constantinople gets becomes the, becomes the new capital, becomes the new capital. There's no reason to send all that wealth exactly. to Rome anymore. Exactly. So it just all stays there, and Rome mm. basically is like a you know, it's like an arm that's been you know. It's like, the, it's, you know, it's the, like a the, withered the fruit. Yeah, bread, it's like a know? withered fruit on the vine that's no longer getting any nourishment. Yeah. Yep. Okay, turn to page 46 at the bottom. Okay, he's talking about wealth. He's talking about stewardship. He says, It befits those who possess sound judgment to recognize that they've received wealth as a stewardship, not for their own enjoyment. Okay? That is... He says they've received wealth. Okay, I, I've told you before, you know, I'm far right wing, <clears throat> capitalist, whole nine yards. I earn what I have. I made, you know, kind of what, what's he saying here? They've received it as a gift, and they are stewards of it. In other words, it's like saying, this iPhone, it's not really mine. It's been loaned to me. It can be taken back. Okay, these pens, these books, whatever. So, when they're parted from it, that is, when those who recognize that what they have is a gift and a loan, when they're parted from it, they rejoice as those who relinquish what's not really theirs. Instead of becoming downcast like those stripped of their own. Now, if I were to go around and ask you to, you know, dump out your pockets or your purses or whatever, and I were to just start taking things, I, there'd probably be some downcast faces. Because <laughs> you'd be, what the hell are you doing? That's mine. Give it back kind of a thing. And I could say, no, no, no. You're just a steward of that. 
and I need it. <laughs> kind of an <laughs> iPhone 5, and you know. Um, so he says, Well, why then are you sad? Okay, keep in mind, he's talking to the rich man. Not the rich man in the story, but all rich men. So why are you sad? Why do you mourn in your soul, hearing, sell your possessions? If your belongings could follow you to the future life, what good would they do? If, on the other hand, they must remain here, why not sell them now and obtain the profit? And when he says sell, he might mean literally sell, get something in return. He might also mean the what's meant in the original meaning of the word sell in English, which is give. Give. Okay? You're not disappointed when you must spend gold in order to purchase a horse. But when you have the opportunity to exchange corruptible things for the kingdom of heaven, you shed tears. What are you doing? You're expending gold for an even more valuable horse. <laughs> a horse in heaven, as it were. Okay. What language are these written in? Greek. You shed tears, spurning the one who asked of you and refusing to give anything while contriving a million excuses for your own ex Oh, I need this. It's mine, you know, kind of a... So, what are you going to answer? How are you going to... What, what are you going to say to God? You gorgeously array your walls, but do not clothe your fellow human being. That is, you put these beautiful, rich tapestries on your wall, or you have this wonderful mosaic. You know, every year... You know, a, a new archaeological discovery is found, and they find, you know, a wall with a mosaic or a fresco on it, which hugely expensive back then. You adorn your horses, but turn away from the shameful plight of your brother or sister. It's like Scrooge talking about, you know, to Jacob Marley, saying, Jacob, you were a good businessman. What does Jacob Marley say? Humanity was my business. As he realizes, he's screwed. Okay? <laughs> you allow grain to rot in your barns, but do not feed those who are starving. I mean, you want to get off on a tangent here for a moment? Think of what we in the United States currently use more grain for than anything else. Everybody know what it is? Is it methane? It's no. Ethanol. Ethanol. We've turned the use of corn to add to our gasoline to quote unquote extend it a little more and because it's green, okay, rather than food, rather than feed, okay, we now use more corn for ethanol than we do for food. Has starving stopped around the world? No. Has starving stopped in the United States? No. Huh. You allow grain to rot in your gas tank, <laughs> but do not feed those who are starving. You hide gold in the earth, or in First Tennessee, or, you know, Bank of America, or wherever, but ignore the oppressed. And then he goes on about wives, you know. Which I'm not even going to talk about. <laughs> so, get to the end of that paragraph. Those who love gold do not mind being bound with manacles. I love this passage. As long as their chains are of gold. Think bling, you know. Gold chains around your neck and everything. So, you know. And what does he call it? Manacles. It's like a straitjacket. Okay. Page 49, the end of that first long paragraph. You showed no mercy. It will not be shown to you. Woo! That's the whole thing, judge not lest you be not judged. That's also, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Christ says, 
and, and the Apostle Paul says, you will be forgiven on the, on the merit that you forgive, period. You forgive others their sins, they will be forgiven, period. They will not be held against them. You open not your house, you'll be expelled from the kingdom. That is, you didn't open your house to the poor, God's not going to open his house to you. You gave not your bread, nor will you receive eternal bread. Now, imagine being in his congregation. Imagine having this homily delivered. And you're sitting there, and you're filthy rich. Well, I'm not going to throw you know, I'm going to talk to the bishop. Well, he was the bishop. You, know, you can't go any higher than the bishop. Okay. Next paragraph. Okay, so you claim you're a pauper. You say you're poor, that you don't have enough. I agree. You are poor. What's he poor in? Spirit, however. Okay. You're not poor because you lack many things. He says no. Skip down several lines. Their soul is eaten away with cares as they compete in the struggle for success. Is that what Christ means when he says it's easier for a rich man, uh, easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven? Okay. And here's another pet passage. Page 50. Some of these are just passages, you know, they're zingers <laughs> that are so great. Right about in the middle of page 50. Hades never says enough. Nor does the greedy person ever say enough. Hades never says Eh, I'm full. No. It always takes more and more. <coughs> Have you ever known somebody greedy like that? I mean, I've known one or two. Not many people. But one or two who have just, you know, just always wanted more and more. Page 51, right? Again, about in the middle. What neighbor, what confidant, what friend is not swept away? Nothing withstands the influence of wealth. Everything submits to its tyranny. Everything cowers at its dominion. I mean, think about this. If one of us did, okay, I'm going to assume something here. If one of us did what O.J. Simpson did, would we be free? That is, if one of us killed our former spouse, would we be walking around free? No. Now, hang on. He was acquitted by a jury of his peers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he is innocent until proven guilty. On, the, on what basis? <laughs> I, I can't remember. I was too <laughs> on the basis of the best attorneys money can buy. And I do mean... The best. I mean, Bernie Sheck, who is one of his, um, Bernard Sheck, who is one of his defense attorneys, is this guy who's, who does a lot of stuff with DNA testing. Okay? And he was able to get that testing thrown out because of, quote-unquote, contamination. Okay? But he's known for doing this. So, I mean, he's good at what he does. Right? But what does he mean? Do the poor have any chance against the loaded, against the wealthy? No. No. I mean, let's leave O.J. out of the picture since he is back in jail for other crimes. Yeah. Um, would any one of us still be out of jail if we had forgotten to pay $300,000, I think it was, in back taxes? No. Who are you referring to? Uh, former Secretary of the Treasury. Oh, right. Ben Bernanke. Wait, was it? Oh. No, it wasn't Ben Bernanke. Was it Secretary of the Treasury? Yeah, it was. Um, Timmy, Timmy, Timmy. Uh, Tim Geithner. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Who was also a former Fed chairman for the Fed Bank of New York. Okay. His plea, it was a uh, TurboTax error. No, it wasn't a TurboTax error. Wait, it was wait, wait, hold on, hold on, taxes. 
Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary of the Treasury. TurboTax? That's what he says. That's what he said. There are currently... There are currently... I know he knows how to do it. There are currently over 300 members of the White House staff. White House staff. Okay, first of all, over 300 members of staff to run the White House? Really? <laughs> um, who owe something like over $500,000 in taxes. There's over 300,000 federal employees who, over three, who owe over $3 billion in taxes. $3 billion. Okay? And they're not being made to repay. For some reason, talk about yeah. Talk about you know, how long shall wealth? Page fifty three, towards the bottom. How long shall wealth be the cause of war? Ooh, I am not one of those who think we went into Iraq for oil. Why? Because we still don't have any more oil. Because we still don't have any oil. I mean, I I think we went into Iraq for proper reasons. Some of them turned out to be wrong the weapons of mass destruction, but all the UN resolutions about Saddam were another big one, but that's another thing. But how long should wealth be the cause of war? World War I did begin because of wealth. World War II began because of wealth. World War II began because of how we treated Germany at the end of World War I with the Treaty of Versailles. I mean, we had World War II kind of coming, right? For which purpose weapons are forged and sword blades wetted. I mean, um, Eisenhower's whole military-industrial complex that he talked about. And it was Eisenhower, a Republican, who was the one who coined that phrase. Okay? Because of wealth, kinsfolk disregard the bond of nature. Meaning they give up their families. And sibling contemplates murder against sibling. Here's a case... I don't know, about 20 years ago. You know, these two rich kids in Southern California. You know the one I'm talking about? Menendez? Yeah, the Menendez brothers, who killed their parents to get their inheritance. Yeah, it's kind of... How does that work? Um, skip several other pages. I'm just asked, didn't they? <laughs> they did. I mean, they tried that. Yeah, there were some... Um, there were issues with those two brothers. Um, as well. Page 57, top of the page. <clears throat> Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Dead offerings are not accepted at the altar. You must rather present a living sacrifice. What does he mean? Well, he's talking about people who say that they will their estates to the poor. And After they're dead. Okay. So what do they do with the wealth while they live? Enjoy it. They hoard it up, exactly. But once they're dead, they're going to give it all to the poor and such. This is kind of, you know, I could be completely wrong here, but I think this is largely, if, if, if Basil were around today, he wouldn't be talking about those willing their estates to the poor. He'd be talking about those willing their estates to a foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as an example. Okay. The one who makes an offering from remnants, that is from what's left. That's like, you know, digging around through your couch, finding pennies and quarters, saying, here, God, this is, this, this is what I have left for you. Yet you offer to the benefactor whatever is left at the end of your life. If you would not dare to entertain dignitaries with the leftovers of, from your table, how dare you propitiate God with scraps? I mean, just think about that for a moment. The boldness of that statement. You would not invite the president into your house and say, uh, let me see what I have in the fridge. What well, leftovers are ready. And yet, that's what you offer God. Ooh, that's dangerous language. Okay? So, instead, get down to page, the bottom of 57. Prepare yourself for your own burial. How? Works of piety are an excellent 
burial garment. Make your departure dressed in the full regalia of your good deeds. Convert your wealth into a truly inseparable adornment. Keep everything with you when you go. Keep, what does he mean, keep everything with you when you go? The results of your good deeds. Be persuaded to this by Christ. He became poor for us. Why? So he might make us rich through his poverty. <clears throat> You know, the word I've used on the board before, kenosis. He completely emptied himself of his glory. Why? So that we might be restored to glory. Okay? So, I mean, that's the end of that homily to the rich. Empty yourself, he is saying. Give it all away. Now, in the next homily, he's going to say some of the same stuff, but he's also going to turn it a little bit. Because now the homily is based on another parable about another rich man. But this is a rich man who has so much, his barns won't even hold everything he has. So he says, I'm going to tear them all down, I'm going to build bigger barns. In other words, Chase Manhattan Bank, or Citibank, isn't big enough to hold all my wealth. So I'm going to make an even bigger bank. An even bigger to fail. Too big to fail bank. All right? And what does God say? Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. In other words, he put all of his faith and all of his trust in what? The future. Not realizing he had no future. So, temptation comes in two forms. Sometimes, is anybody else in here really hot? <clears throat> I hate this room because of it. Well, of course, somebody has not turned up to 86. Oh, <laughs> Now the jet engine's going to kick in. <laughs> he says, temptations come in two forms. Sometimes affliction proves the heart like gold in a furnace. It proves. What does that mean? It removes all the impurities. It refines it. Okay. Testing its purity. How? By means of suffering. But for many... It is prosperity of life that constitutes the greatest trial. In other words, affliction is, a, is an easier kind of suffering. Why? Because prosperity of life is equally difficult to preserve one's soul from despair in hard times and to prevent it from becoming arrogant in prosperous circumstances. That passage from Beowulf that I talked about. Prothgar is talking about, you know, you have everything going for you and what do you think? I'm on the top of the mountain. Nothing's going to take me down. Here I am. I'll stay here forever. And your legs get knocked out underneath for me. Okay? So, this rich man thought he was up here and he would be up here for a long time. Until he discovered his soul was required of him that night. So instead, turn to page 61. And he says in section 2, it seems to me the, the passion afflicting this man resembles the gluttonous who would rather burst as a result of overindulgence than share part of what they had. So, instead, resolve to treat the things in your possession as belonging to others. That's stewardship. After all, the things in your possession bring pleasure for only a little while. And then what do they do? They fade and disappear. Your brand new shiny car, you drive it off the lot, you come to MTSU, somebody sees it, they're angry, they're envious, they're jealous, and they go beside your car and they do this. <sighs> Had that happen once, okay? The car my parents owned, it was brand new. It was an ugly little car, but it was still brand new. And it was like we'd had it one week. Somebody just went right down the whole driver's side of the car with a key. I mean, and took it down to the metal. All right? It fades away and disappears. But afterwards, a strict accounting of their disbursement, that is, the dispersing of the treasures to you, will be demanded. 
parable of the talents. To one man is given ten talents, to another man is given five talents, to another man is given one talent. The man who gets ten goes and gets ten more. The man who gets five goes and gets five more. The man who gets one buries it. Why? Man, you know, I knew you were a hard master, he says, and I wanted to make sure I didn't lose what little I had. And Christ says, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> to whom little is given, little is expected. You know what's Too much is given. Yeah. Is, is they, they mentioned investing it, right? Which, they mention what? Uh, what in the in the parable they invest the. Money, yeah. Right. And which is interesting because. You know, it's not necessarily investing in at interest. I know where you're going with that. They somehow they they did get you know back you know twice as much as they put in. Sure. They, was it investing in a business or like what? I have no idea. I mean, Christ doesn't, doesn't care about. Christ doesn't, yeah, he doesn't care about how the talent was increased, okay? Because what he's saying there, what he's saying there in that parable is, you know, you've been given much. Much will be required, okay? In other words, use the gifts and do what with them? Multiply them. Look at the, um, you know, the feeding of the 5,000. Five loaves, two fish, what happens? What happens when they go back after the feeding of the 5,000? Baskets. Twelve baskets. Okay. Five loaves don't make 12 baskets of crumbs. So what's happened? It's been multiplied. I mean, that's the whole point kind of there. So down here, treat the possessions as belonging to others. Why? Because an accounting is going to be demanded of you. In other words, what you've done with what's been given. All right? And he goes on and says, but you, what do you do instead? You lock everything up. You seal it off in, you know, Fort Knox, as it were. So, section three, don't suffer the same things. After all, look at yourself and look at the earth. What does the earth do? The earth does not nurture fruits for its own enjoyment. That is, the earth doesn't produce flowers. It doesn't produce oranges and apples and grapes and all this wonderful stuff just to go, ah, it's all for me. It does it for others. So therefore, you should do the same. Whatever fruit of good works you bring forth, you produce for yourself. Since the grace of good works redounds to those who perform them. You gave to the poor. And what happened? In so doing, not only did you make what you gave truly your own. That is, you gave to the poor. Say this is my $5 bill, and I give it to the poor. He says, in doing so, you really do make that $5 your own. And what do you do? You give of it freely. Okay? So that it becomes not a loan, as it were. And what happens? you receive back even more. It doesn't mean you mysteriously, mystically, you know, get, boop, there's $5 back in your bank account. Oh, well, if only it worked that way, okay? No, what do you receive back? Credit <laughs> with God? Credit in heaven? That is, the good works add to your soul. They purify. They beautify your soul. So, page 63, top of the page. If it is the honor that derives from wealth that attracts you, well, what kind of honor? What do people do around really wealthy people? They suck up to them. Okay? Why do politicians hold fundraisers? Not for people like us. Okay, I don't know about Chris, but I can't write a check for a hundred grand. I can't write a check for a grand. I can't write a check for a hundred usually. If I give anything in a political campaign, it might be $25. Okay? Doesn't do them any good. So, if is it honor? Then think how much more how much more glory you'll get by having a multitude of children call you father. Than having a multitude of gold coins jingling in your purse. And bear in mind, St. Basil 
set up orphanages for the children of slain parents or dead parents. He set up hospitals. He set up places where women could go who were abused and battered. I mean, and he required his monks to work at these places. He, he, he required that if you're going to start a monastic community, do it at the edge of town. Don't do it off in the middle of the desert, but do it where it can be a hospital for society, where people can come for both physical and spiritual healing. And what does that do? That benefits not only the people in the town, it benefits the monks. It benefits the, the, those who minister to the sick, the poor, the suffering, the sorrowing, etc. He says, okay, skip a few more lines. You, are you faint-hearted in your spending? That is, are you cheap? Are you miserly in your giving away of what you own? When you're about to attain such glory? What does he mean by that? To the measure that you give, that will be the measure that you receive. Of glory, God will receive you. Angels will extol you. All people from the creation of the world will bless you if, if, if you give freely. Your glory will be eternal. <coughs> you will inherit the crown of righteousness and the kingdom of heaven. All these things will be your reward for your, for your stewardship of what? Perishable things. Things that if you just keep them, hoard them, put them in your bank account, will do what over time? Perish. Will a dollar bill last forever? No. Run it through the washing machine a bunch of times, and what happens? It becomes unlegal tender. Take a penny or a gold coin, put it on a railroad track, watch the train go over it. It won't cause it to derail. Okay, and what will it do? It'll flatten out. What will happen to the image on the coin? And if there's no image on the coin, what is it? Worthless. Now, if it's a gold coin, it might be worth the little smidgen of gold that's actually in there. But it will no longer be legal tender because the image is, it's the image that's important. Okay. So, distribute your wealth lavishly. La What's he mean? I, I could be completely wrong here, but I think, he's, I think he's thinking of Christ, you know, telling another parable, and he says, take no thought for the morrow. Look at the lilies of the field. It spins, you know, it doesn't think about, look at the bird. It doesn't plan for tomorrow. Go to a bird nest. You don't find a little pantry with all kinds of food stuffed off. Okay? What does the bird do? It eats today. It hopes it'll eat tomorrow. Take no thought for the morrow. Distribute your, your wealth lavishly. Give what you can today. Do not wait for a dearth of grain to open your granary. What does he mean? Don't wait till there's a famine and then you can go, <laughs> I'm going to jack the price up. Don't wait till gasoline gets scarce. 350, 358, 360, 370, you know. That's, Don't price gouge. That's also <laughs> interesting because if you think of the, uh, the story of Joseph where he actually, because, you know, his, his plan, which came from God, was to have all these granaries, fill them up with grain, so that later when there was a famine, he could distribute it. Um, yeah, but what... what he didn't the, distribute it freely. I'm not saying exactly. That, uh, well, no, he did distribute it for gain. Right. When that happened, that is the idea. There was to build up this store because there was a famine coming, and therefore there would be grain to distribute. It wasn't build it all up so that when there's a famine, you can then charge people through the nose and make them poor. All right. Though he does, you know, play some tricks with his family there, but then you know. 
payback is delicious. Kind of <laughs> <clears throat> so do not, you know, he says at the top of 64, do not make common need a means of private gain. This is like, you know, when a hurricane hits. Don't, you know, Home Depot should not raise the price of, you know, um, sheathing or three, uh, four by eight sheets of plywood because they can't. No, he's saying don't be a dealer in human misery because what do you do when, when that happens? You increase misery by charging more when things are really bad. He's almost saying exactly the opposite. Give more freely when things, you know. What happened if you were around here in um, the Good Friday uh, tornado of 2010? Okay. When that thing hit, first house it hit in Murfreesboro was at the end of my street. I was, in, I was actually in my car at the end of the street. All these cars were coming in. They're pulling over to the right. And I'm like, what's everybody doing? I'm looking off to the left. I turned and looked to the right. And there's this big, huge black V, quarter of a mile from me. Took up most of the sky. Sucker was absolutely huge. And I'm like, oh my God, I've always wanted to see a tornado. <laughs> I don't need to see one now. If I jam that car in reverse, I get back home. My house is, you know, our street's about 200 yards long. I get home and it comes and it's off the ground and it just takes the roof off the house at the end of the street. And then it lifts up, it skips a couple neighborhoods. And then right around John Rice Boulevard, it comes out, and, poof, and that's when it really started. But what happened? Seem to sort yeah. Of have a plan. But what happened the next day? People in Murfreesboro were out in droves, helping. Okay. People were buying food. People were buying supplies. People were going helping others get. Okay. That was an example, I think, of what he's talking about: of not dealing in human misery. Okay, um, we'll stop there. I want to pick up with section four when we come back on Tuesday. We'll finish this on Tuesday easily. So, and I'll have your exams on Tuesday. So Tuesday we can start. Uh, we might be able to start the theological poetry of St. Gregory because I'm not going to talk about... The appendix on mercy and justice, the pseudo bazillion homily. Uh, but I do want to talk about lending on interest and the thing on famine and drought. Okay. All right, that's all.